Welcome and thank you for joining this virtual discussion hosted by Foundation for Defense of Democracies. It's Friday, March 8th. I'm Jonathan Shanzer, Senior Vice President for Research here at FTD. Our panel today will discuss Turkey and its role in facilitating illicit finance and its support of terrorism. Turkey's been in and out of the headlines for the last five months because of its support for the terrorist group Hamas, which of course perpetrated those attacks on Israel on October 7th. Since then, I think the world has learned quite a bit about Turkey's support for this Palestinian terrorist organization. It has a major headquarters in Istanbul. The president of Turkey, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, meets often with some of the top officials of Hamas, including some of the military figures that were involved in the attacks of 10-7, as well as other attacks during previous wars. But Hamas is just a small piece of this, right? We know that uh, the regime in Turkey has been involved in facilitating the activities of the Islamic State. Back when that was a major problem in the Middle East, the Turks were allowing ISIS fighters to fly into the airport in Istanbul. The fighters then made their way east to enter into Iraq and Syria. We know about illicit uh, oil schemes. We learned about illicit antiquity schemes, all designed to raise money for the Islamic State while the Turkish regime turned a blind eye. Today, we see Islamist groups affiliated with Al-Qaeda still operating in Syria with facilitation by the regime in Ankara. Unbelievable that it is still happening to this day. Then we can take another step back and take a look at something that made massive headlines years ago, but is still being watched today. I'm speaking here about the so-called gas for gold scheme. This was a $20 billion illicit financial scheme facilitated by the Turks and the Iranians, all designed to help bring money to the theocracy in Iran at the height of our sanctions uh, designed to prohibit Iran's nuclear program. Today, there are questions swirling about whether Turkey is facilitating additional illicit financial schemes for the regime in Moscow, for Vladimir Putin, but also for Venezuela. Lots of questions still out there about what's going on with this Turkish regime, which of course is still a member of NATO. We'll talk about all of that and more today with our panel. And so I'm pleased now to introduce that panel for today's discussion. First, we've got Galia Lindenstrauss, who is a senior research fellow at the Institute for National Security Studies and editor of the Institute's journal, Strategic Assessment. Galia specializes in Turkish foreign policy. Her additional research int interests are ethnic conflicts, Azerbaijan's foreign policy, the Cyprus issue, and the Kurds. She has written extensively on these topics, and her commentaries and op-eds have appeared in numerous publications globally. Then we've got Michael Rubin, who's a senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. He specializes there in Iran, Turkey, and the broader Middle East. Former, formerly, he's, uh, he worked as a Pentagon official, taught classes at sea to deployed U.S. Navy and Marine units, and he's authored several books. By the way, he's joined me as a guest on the FTD Morning Brief as well. Then we've got Tuche Barol, who is an adjunct professor at San Diego City College. She has received degrees in international relations, from Ida Tepe University and Katira Haas University and conducted postdoctoral research in Moscow State University Faculty of Global Studies. She has worked as an assistant professor in Turkey until 2015 before moving to California, where she received a second master's degree from San Diego State University in 2020. Moderating today's conversation is my colleague Sinan Gidi, a non-resident senior fellow at FDD and an expert on Turkish domestic politics and foreign policy. Sinan was the executive director of the Institute of Turkish Studies based at Georgetown University, and he continues to serve as an adjunct associate professor at Georgetown University's School of Foreign Service. He was born in Turkey and educated in the United Kingdom. Before we dive into our feature discussion, just a few words here about FDD. For more than 20 years, FDD has operated as a fiercely independent nonpartisan research institute exclusively focused on national security and foreign policy. As a point of pride and principle, we do not accept foreign government funding. For more on our work, please visit our website, fdd.org, and follow us on Twitter at FDD. That's it for me now. Sinan, over to you. Well, good morning and welcome to our first uh, virtual event on the Turkey program at FTD during 2024. And we're 
thrilled, as John said, uh, to welcome a good, a fantastic panel of colleagues, and we're delighted to have them. And so thank you all for making uh, time for this. I think we have a lot of issues to discuss. And I think I would agree with John, and you probably would too, that um, any one of the number of issues that he mentioned, we could probably spend uh, an eternity or at least a good part of a day sort of elaborating and expanding upon if we had the time, which we don't. Uh, so we are here for approximately the next 55 minutes uh, of discussion. And um, in addition to the conversation that we are having uh, and that, we, that will be posted on our website after this, uh, should you be interested in further work, you can do one of two things. Um, on the landing page for this event, we have actually highlighted some research work uh, published by uh, various outlets uh, uh, that uh, FDD has put on its website. Uh, I think I may be the primary author of some of those, um, but that's one point of interest. If you should be, you know, if you have further curiosity on these, some of these issues that we, that we touch upon. But also, I would encourage you to follow uh, the social media and publication record of all of our panelists today who obviously continue to do extensive work on some of the issues that we're going to talk about. But without further ado, I'm just going to launch straight into it. Um, and I, if I may, I'll start with you, Galia. Um, it is obvious that Turkey has played, I would call, a hypocritical role in the Gaza war since October 7th. Um, on the one hand, what we see is Turkey, prior to this, trying to normalize ties. Trying to normalize ties. Right. But at the, following the beginning of the war, it, this sort of posture became quickly overshadowed by Erdogan's full-fledged support of Hamas. While Ankara condemns the military campaign against Hamas by Israel, it continues to engage in trade, especially firms who are owned by AKP elites, not least of all one of Erdogan's sons, but also persons like former Prime Minister Bin Ali Yildirim. What are we to make of Turkey's stance on this issue? Thank you. Thank you for being here. I'm, I'm really happy to join the discussion. Um, it's true that Turkey is a significant trade partner for Israel. Uh, some years it was uh, the, uh, among uh, Israel was uh, among the top ten export markets of Turkey. Now it's only the top uh, in the sixteenth uh, market uh, for Turkey's exports. Um, it should be emphasized, however, that uh, mutual trade uh, volume has gone down between the states uh, already before the October seventh war. And we have witnessed actually a 30% decline in 2023 compared to 2022. But it's, however, more an issue of reduced demand in Israel because of um, the slowing down of the Israeli economy, and especially the slowing down of the, the building sector in Israel, uh, than an intentional policy uh, on behalf of Ankara to reduce trade. Uh, the continuing trade between uh, Israel and Turkey, as you mentioned, is, is used to criticize uh, President er Erdogan, both from within the country and from the outside. Uh, people say he has not matched his very harsh rhetoric against Israel uh, with actions, and since he's not cut uh, trade relations with Israel. Um, but actually, from my perspective, we should criticize Erdogan's uh, hypocrisies on different grounds. Uh, first of all, uh, Turkey knows well from its own history and uh, current challenges the difficulties and dilemmas of uh, combating a terror organization uh, such as Hamas. And I see zero reflection of that in public statements coming out of Ankara. And second, that if Turkey is really uh, worried about the well-being of Palestinian people, uh, I would say Hamas is completely irresponsible. And if I can add also suicidal, in a way, acts on October 7th, uh, proves that it's not an actor that can be relied upon uh, for um, promoting the well-being of the Palestinians. And again, I don't see any rethinking of its status in Ankara. Ankara still says it's not a terror organization, and I think there's no uh, new reflection uh, on behalf of Ankara. And I'll stop here uh, with this remark. Well, let me follow up there because you've, you've, you've opened some interesting doors there. Um... Do, so do we think at this point that this sort of what I would call a charade of trying to normalize ties with Israel prior to October 7, uh, vice subsequent sort of actions calling Israel a terrorist state and referring to Prime Minister Netanyahu as a Nazi, quote, um, is just basically that Ankara has given up on all of this and it's prioritized vilifying Israel ahead of pursuing any meaningful dialogue to essentially rebuild substantive ties with a strong U.S. ally and basically the only robust democracy in the Middle East. 
So still in this current crisis, uh, we see mostly harsh rhetoric. Uh, we still haven't seen uh, actions on behalf of Ankara in the sense that uh, diplomatic relations have not been downgraded. And actually the first country to call its ambassador for consultations uh, has been Israel. Israel withdrew its ambassador from Turkey before uh, Turkey withdrew its ambassador uh, from uh, Israel. I think uh, Turkey wants to be very much involved in the day after uh, the war in, in Gaza, and but it's sidelined. Currently it's sidelined. Uh, basically it doesn't have, it's not used for mediation as uh, Egypt and, and Qatar is. Obviously uh, other actors have much, much more impact on the way things are going. And uh, Turkey is only currently acting mostly as a spoiler, I would say. Well, one final question on that sense, um, and then I'll go to Michael. Um, so the, one of the, the, the theme and topic of this panel is essentially looking at illicit finance on, on you know, at a, at a, at a, at a heavy scale. Um, and I think it would be fair to say that uh, a lot of ongoing research, not just at FDD, but uh, across uh, Washington organizations, as well as over, over in Europe, seems to suggest that Turkey seems uh, plays a front row sort of seat in providing uh, or at least channeling uh, funds uh, to Hamas in Gaza in, in quite sophisticated ways. From you, I mean, you're in Israel, so you and you follow this stuff quite, uh, quite, you know, quite closely. What would you say is the role that Ankara plays in facilitating, you know, monetary transfers to Hamas from domestic and international sources? So again, from the perspective we got after October 7th and the understanding that all along Hamas was preparing for a big offensive, uh, clearly ammunitions, money, and building supplies for tunnels that were delivered to Hamas through Turkey uh, are a big part of the story. Uh, just in September, there was a news report on explosive materials uh, to produce rockets in bags containing plaster that were confiscated uh, from the Israeli port authorities that were coming uh, for Turkey. And again, when you, you, you understand now that Hamas was preparing its stocks of rockets uh, to enable this infiltration of the fence between Gaza and Israel in 30 locations and to commit all these atrocities um, it did under this rocket fire on Israel, then of course Hamas's activity uh, on Turkish soil gets uh, even more sinister meaning than uh, we thought before. And even if I take face value, the stories of supposedly people working for the Mossad uh, being arrested in Turkey and add up the numbers, uh, one can understand that a lot of illicit Hamas activities is taking place in Turkey. Uh, same is true for stories of arrest of people in Israel that were operating for Hamas. And all these stories, when you look at them, usually have a Turkish angle. Either the person was a student in, uh, in Turkey or repeatedly visited the country and met uh, Hamas operatives there. Uh, so to some, I would say that uh, as part of Israel's mistakes of letting Hamas grow to the level it grew in Gaza, in Gaza um, accepting as a fact that Turkey allows such illicit activities to happen on its soil was also a mistake. And Israel should be much more adamant in the future that its relations with Turkey will progress only if Turkey will seriously cut down on its relations with Hamas. Yeah, thanks, Gali. I mean, that, that's a tragic point that we could again spend forever talking about because um, since October 7, what we've seen on the US side is, uh, you know, sanctions against persons and entities in Turkey that are directly uh, uh, materially supporting Hamas activities, either financially or from a recruitment perspective, you know, we've seen an uptick in sanctions behavior, uh, mainly, you know, uh, that we have consistently warned about at FDD for, for, for a number of years now. But I think October 7 seems to have been a sort of a watershed moment. But uh, more on that later. Michael, um, just picking off where essentially Galia left off. I mean, you also write extensively on this. You speak on this extensively. But um, what do you make of, um, you know, what, what Ankara wants to sort of what does the what does the world um, want? Uh, Ankara, you know, to, to you know, what role does Ankara want the world to believe it's playing in relation to the Gaza war? Because it, it seems to have a particular message that it wants to convey as to what Turkey is trying to achieve. On the one hand, it says it wants to play a mediating role, right, for a two-state solution. Um, uh, you know, and on the other hand, what we've seen in, through FDD research, which has been quite revelatory, I would say, um, is basically Turkey, as Gali has sort of uh, outlined uh, quite ably. Um, is a sort of base for channeling 
monies from worldwide Hamas supporters to the actual main uh, organization in Gaza. Um, is the Turkish government unaware of this, or can we say it's actually participating and enabling in it, all these sort of actions? Well, first, Sinan, let me just give my commendation to FTD for consistently being ahead of the curve on this issue. In answer to your question, unfortunately, I'd say we, the world, and certainly we in the United States are naive. The White House likes to say the adults are back in charge, but too often we're like babes in the wood, too willing to believe what we are told, too little sense and appreciation of the history at play. Allowing Turkey to have any role in Gaza is akin to making Germany peacekeepers in Sudetenland or allowing Italy to um, take the lead role internationally in Libya. Unfortunately, that's what the international community did there. We tend to be ignorant of the ulterior motives of Turkey. They're religious, they're ideological, they're historical, they're psychological. I mean, we have the same pattern as Iran where we constantly give Turkey a blank slate uh, and engage in wishful thinking. Uh, the last thing I would say just on that issue is we don't pay attention to what Turkey is saying outside of English. So for example, we just saw the Taliban uh, unleash Turkish propaganda um, with a backdrop that was constructed inside Turkey of, uh, of Jerusalem. And the same thing happens in Somalia. So I would say um, that we've, we've simply got to uh, see the big picture and stop being led around by the nose by Turkish diplomats. We've got to calibrate our policy to what reality is rather than what wishful thinking would, would suggest. Uh, no doubt. Um, th thank you for, uh, for, um, for that injection, Michael. But if we had to drill down a bit, um, there seems to be this sort of bifurcation of lines of effort by the US government, right? So um, in holding Turkey to account over some of these transgressions, right? Or some of these, uh, what we would call um, you know, illegal behavior. On the one hand, we've got, as I just mentioned previously, you know, the uh, Treasury Department uh, increasing its sanctions behavior for some pretty interesting people, uh, anywhere that's, you know, recently sanctioned uh, Hamas liaison between the Turkish government and, uh, and Hamas got proper in Gaza, Jihad Yamur, to, uh, 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 you know, uh, major construction firms which seem to be funneling monies from around the world to Gaza proper, such as Trend GYO, a major Turkish construction company, which was recently sanctioned. But on the other hand, what we see is um, the State Department, our colleagues at the State Department here, you know, um, following the sort of Swedish accession to NATO, we saw quite sort of, I would say, um, rosy behavior, uh, trying to sort of latch on to this sort of, let's see if we can bring Turkey back into the Western fold by making promises such as, you know, if Turkey continues down the right way, we could possibly put it back into the F-35 program. So there seems to be some sort of discord in terms of government action towards what we want to do with Turkey. What would you say about that? Well, I would say that you actually put your finger right on the problem. And what we're seeing is the, the corruption, if you will, of diplomacy um, and the triumph of wishful thinking over reality. As your staff, I mean, people like Jonathan Shanzer, who worked in Treasury in the wake of 9-11 understand is that President Bush issued an executive order empowering the Treasury Department to designate terrorists. And every now and then what I'll do is I'll look at the State Department's terrorism list and I'll compare it to the Treasury Department's terrorism list, which is about 30 times as long. And the biggest difference between the two is that the Treasury Department is objective rather than subjective when they actually designate terrorists. There's a lesson there. But I would build on what Gallia said, and I, I agree with what she said, it was excellent. We've got to understand as the US government and the broader international community has to understand, terrorism isn't just the military action. That's the tip of the iceberg. There's also the, um, the financial, the logistical, the safe haven. Unfortunately, Turkey checks all the boxes. I hate to be the one, but I think you're muted. <laughs> I, I haven't actually encountered that since the COVID times, but thank you, Michael. <laughs> yes. And, um, uh, so shifting slightly north of Turkey's uh, borders, um, uh, just to keep on this theme of illicit finance, but also um, possibly support of terrorism, if you, depending on how you classify Russian action uh, in Ukraine, 
right? Um, but we'll definitely come back to the Middle East in, in just a few minutes. But I wanted to move on to Tuche here, who consistently, um, I followed her for several years now, her work on Turkish-Russian relations, particularly in relation to Turkish-Russian uh, energy ties, what some have called the sort of asymmetric sort of dependence of Turkey upon Russia, is, is quite fascinating if you're interested in this. But I would say, you know, one of the areas, uh, Tuche, that Turkey is trying to sort of project itself as a, as a, as a, as a sort of constructive member of NATO is, is in relation to um, uh, its, its role in, in, in the Ukraine war. Um, but what we do know is Turkey's ties with Vladimir Putin's Russia are extensive, right? They have really forged a working relationship despite widely differing worldviews. They've been able to compartmentalize quite effectively, particularly since after 2016. Um, this relationship is not just limited to energy ties, but there's a realm of illicit financing that has, that has allowed Russians to access the Turkish financial system since the beginning of the Ukraine war with the intention of Russian elites circumventing international sanctions, right? So such transactions arguably undermine the West's effort to defeat Putin as he continues to prosecute his illegal war in Ukraine. So based on what you've seen and what you follow, Tuche, how extensive is this sort of permissiveness to circumvent uh, 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 Russian, you know, sanctions on Russia? And why does Erdogan permit such access to illicit monies to enter the world's financial system? Thank you so much, Sinan, for inviting me to this panel. As you are all aware, Turkey adopted a balanced approach uh, towards the Russia-Ukraine conflict that began in February 2022. What does it mean? For example, Turkey has supplied drones to Ukraine while condemning Russia's annexation of Ukrainian territory. However, the Erdogan government has encouraged both public and private financial institutions to accept illicit Russian money from the beginning. Not to mention, since October 2021, Turkey has been on the gray list of Financial Action Task Force. So the number of companies with Russian partnership increased from hundreds to 1300s between February 2022 to uh, February 2023. And in the same period, Russian citizens purchased more than 16,000 houses in Turkey. So this is just what's happening in Turkey. There is also another part of the story. Now, we observe money being transferred by Russian citizens, not only to Turkey, but also to northern Cyprus. So North Cyprus is becoming a concern, well, growing a concern right now. Following the shutdown of over 100,000 um, suspicious accounts, shell companies by the Cypriot government, Russian citizens have started purchasing properties on North Cyprus right now, and they're just using trusts. So all these trusts are anonymous. And briefly, Turkey is not joining Western sanctions against Russia, uh, but providing a safe hub uh, for Russian money operations. So following uh, the President Biden's December 2023 executive order, a few dynamics are shifting toward uh, Russian accounts in the Turkish financial system, but it's a recent uh, development. So the U.S. Treasury now has the power to sanction uh, non-U.S. companies that aid Russia's defense industry. So just this week, according to Russian news sources, at least two Turkish banks have started closing uh, Russian uh, bank accounts and some companies' accounts following the U.S. threat of blacklisting them. Your question, why Erdogan is permitting these illegal money transfers? So if you ask me, there are two reasons. First is money. Er Turkey's economy has been weakened, if not collapsed. Right. At the same time, Erdogan became a dictator, but uh, even though his country lacked uh, natural resources to sell, it's not an oil or natural gas uh, country. And second, he needs a political support. Yes, technically, Turkey is in the Western alliance. But over the perhaps the last 10 years, what we see Turkey's democracy has declined sharply and Ankara's commitment to Western partners has weakened. So it appears that Erdogan is more easily receiving polit political support from Putin than from his Western counterparts. But, yeah, so I'm playing, uh, yeah, I'm throwing you what I would call a softball to you. But isn't Turkey a NATO ally? I mean, you know, don't we have expectations of, you know, significant sort of NATO countries, what the bare minimum we should do? Um, but, you know, more substantively, I would say, to what extent do you agree that uh, Putin probably has Erdogan over a barrel, right? I mean, that Turkey under Erdogan has really become just disproportionately dependent upon Russian goodwill. I'm talking about things like dependence on 
uh, the Russian uh, nuclear facility that's being built, uh, the, the the absolute vital lifeline that you know Russia's economy throws to Turkish farmers due to produce exports, the t Russian tourism, not to mention the natural gas that Turkey is dependent upon, which Putin essentially uh, you know has sort of snarled at after Turkey you know j uh, down the Russian jet in 2015, right, and showed what he was capable of in terms of holding Turkey to account and basically back down from opposing Russia. Do you think that Erdogan just simply has no choice but to capitulate and continue working with, with Putin? Or is there, as you say, you know, just this dependency on, you know, monies coming into the Turkish financial system due to Turkey's very weakened economy? Yes. Last, last time I checked, Turkey is a NATO member. Uh, here's my point here. Uh, it was before um, 2014, uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine, the Crimean part, uh, when I was in uh, Russia doing my postdoctorate researches, I started calling the energy relationship between Turkey and Russia, uh, no offense, but Ukrainization of Turkey, because Russia is infiltrating Turkey's energy uh, market strongly, not only exporting, but building nuclear power plant in the southern shore of Mediterranean coast of Turkey, right? And officially, right now, we know they declared that they are interested in building the second one, this time in the Black Sea coast of Turkey. That's not the end of the story. They want to build a natural gas storage in the Thracian part of Turkey. All these are part of Russian strategy to infiltrate into Turkey's energy market. OK, strongly. This is what they did before the Ukrainian revolution, you know, controlling all these critical areas. And it is uh, available when you have a, particularly a corrupted leader like Erdogan in the system. Right. So this is what I observe at the moment. So, you know, you know, the shorter part of this uh, question that I have a final question on this issue for you to chair would be to ask you, um, you know, if you have any sort of headline numbers that you want our viewers to take away in terms of some of this, you know, illicit finance that goes through Turkey, part of some of the stuff that we've written about at FTD seems to suggest not only the shipment of dual use goods to Russia, such as microelectronics that have been seized and, and identified. Um, we've seen, for example, crypto finance movements. I've even heard of things like illicit coal trade, right, between Russian bootleggers that have essentially you know, uh, uh, across the Black Sea and which are basically illegal coal, bootlegged coal is distributed through Turkey, mainly from the sources of AKP elites that I've heard, but um, you can answer to that. But the bigger question I have is, you know, um, given that Turkey seems to be playing such a sort of lackluster or duplicitous role, at least, in the Ukraine conflict as a NATO member, why is the NATO alliance uh, not holding Turkey to stronger account on this issue? Uh, your first question, first of all, I didn't hear the coal, uh, coal trade between Russia and Turkey, but I can tell you that I know that uh, a lot of Russian tankers uh, changing their names and changing their codes, just uh, passing through the Turkish streets every day. Okay, There are some uh, journalists specifically expert in this issue. Uh, so second question, yes. Uh, NATO countries are struggling to uh, Turkey into account. Why? Assuming that Turkey is part of the Western Airlines, okay? It's not the only country in the West that violates sanctions against Russia. Unfortunately, there are other countries. So this is a card in Turkey's hand. And the second reason is Turkey's current unpredictability in foreign policy. Just one example. Yes, we are talking about Russian... Uh, uh, increasing influence in Turkish energy market and foreign policy for so. But today, Zelensky visited uh, Istanbul and met with Erdogan. And according to Zelensky's office, you know what? Uh, the Ukrainian leader also visited shipyards, where these Turkish shipyards are, you know, uh, building some corvettes for Ukrainian Navy. So I'm, I'm not saying this, it's a wonderful policy, okay? Don't take it uh, wrong, please. I'm just trying to display the unpredictability because you know what? Next week, I cannot guarantee that Turkey will not order second S-400 missiles. Maybe it can happen to, this is what we are talking about. This is the unpredictability. 
So given all these circumstances, I do not anticipate any severe backlash from the West or NATO towards Erdogan because he uh, actually settled himself a very uh, good place uh, in uh, these negotiations between Ukraine and Russia. That's why he organized, I mean, Erdogan organized this meeting with Zelensky. And you know what? Just after the Russian elections, Putin will visit Turkey. Uh, in mid-March. Uh, and then let's see what will happen that day. Thank you. That's uh, Yes, I mean, just the unpredictability is something that we've become accustomed to, uh, which some say, and I would agree with this view, um, that uh, essentially it's a reflection of Turkey's sort of hyper-presidential system, which basically allows, you know, President Erdogan to essentially wake up uh, and, and and call the shots as he, as he sees fit without much sort of resistance uh, at all. But, um, you know, Galia, if I could just turn to you, because there's a sort of cross-pollination of, of an idea there, um, which is, you know, that I'm sure you're accustomed to. You know, uh, Tuche just mentions, you know, ships changing sort of transponders and names, you know, that are destined to Russia to avoid sort of, you know, uh, uh, Western monitoring of, of goods and materials going to Russia, such as going to Russia, the use of goods um, that are used for um, weapons manufacturing. Isn't Turkey also doing that in terms of uh, ships that, are, that leave Turkish ports, um, chain transponders uh, such that they don't seem to be essentially docking in Israel and offloading goods? What, what, what's your sense of that? So first of all, I think just go, going back to the comparison uh, with Ukraine, I think it's interesting uh, that Turkey managed to do a very a quite balanced approach to Ukraine and that gave it power also in the negotiations uh, between Russia and Ukraine. And had it presented a, a little bit more balanced uh, approach to the Israel-Hamas uh, conflict, I think that would have also helped it have a more uh, helpful role in, in uh, again, possible uh, post-war uh, in Gaza scenarios. So I think in this respect, Turkey made a mistake. It could have said, yes, I resent a lot of Israel's policy regarding the Palestinians, but I denounce what Hamas did on October 7th. So just that's just the point of comparison. Uh, with regard to um, the issue of energy, uh, of course, there's uh, Israel gets quite a substantial amount of its oil uh, from Azerbaijan, uh, from the pipeline, uh, the Baku Jehan uh, pipeline, and from there uh, in tankers to uh, Israel. And this has continued. This is another thing that uh, Erdogan is criticized about. But I think it gives uh, this Azerbaijan angle actually. Uh, moderates a little uh, Erdogan's uh, response to Israel. And um, I think this has been quite helpful, the fact that uh, Azerbaijan is pressuring uh, Turkey to lower uh, its its ire against uh, Israel. Michael, what do you think? Um, Gadia raised a point in her opening sort of um, comments, which which I've made note of, and I, and I couldn't help but, um, you know, you've written extensively about this which is not sort of in the, uh, the the panel description, but I think it helps underline a point, which is this notion of Turkey sort of, you know, uh, quote unquote, you know, ter terrorism question itself, the one that it, it wants the world to essentially realize, which is, you know, its fight with the PKK since the 1980s. And Gali made the point that essentially, how can Turkey countenance what Hamas is doing when it knows full well what the PKK has sort of visited upon Turkey since the 1980s? And, I, and, and with a particular view to, you know, what we see now with the PYDYPG, it's kind of topical because you and I previously spoke just before the panel started, um, whereby, you know, Turkish foreign minister is in Washington trying to get the administration to end support for the Syrian Kurdish uh, PYDYPG forces, which it wants, you know, which it labels as a terrorist organization because of its links to the PKK. Um, I've called this, and I think you backed me up on this, as just a manufactured threat for Erdogan. Right, that allows him to essentially, you know, do the strongman front at home to attract voters. And essentially, the PYD, whilst it's historically related to the PKK, is not actually a security threat to Turkey. Well, what's your so? What do you say about the lack of empathy towards uh, 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 Israel's sort of terrorism concern, whilst Turkey sort of turns a blind eye and and, and bombs and uh, a critical U.S. partner in the region? Well, in many ways, Sinan, I mean, the question is asked and answered. And you've highlighted the, the hypocrisy there. Look, you know some of my personal background here. I was held at gunpoint by the PKK in northern Iraq back around 2000, 2001. 
I've since traveled extensively across the autonomous administration of North and East Syria, and I see the evolution there. But if we want to look at the big picture, one of the biggest problems we have in international relations is that there is no standard definition of terrorism. It's like that old Supreme Court case in the United States where about um, pornography in which the Supreme Court Justice Potter Stewart said, well, I can't define it, but I know it when I see it. That's the same attitude the international community takes with regard to terrorism. According to Columbia University, they had chronicled 100 different definitions of terrorism just among the United Nations and Western security agencies in the year 1988. By 2006, that was up to 250 different definitions. So the end result is an a la carte approach where we're always against terrorism unless it happens to be for a cause with, with which I agree. If I had to be policy prescriptive, what I would just say is that the United States and Israel should not give anyone any counterterrorism assistance unless they first sign on to a standard definition of terrorism, which we put forward. If we can get 70 or 80 countries signed on, that gives us a block where we can affect policy. So we keep, so we keep avoiding, um, in order to avoid this, um, this, 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 um, what do you call it? This loophole that Turkey engages in, which you highlight. I mean, Turkey at this point is sponsoring terrorism while lecturing the world that it is trying to defend itself. The only country that's gotten away with it, like Turkey, has been Pakistan. Right. I mean, uh, um, you know, I'm I'm kind of impressed and, and, and saddened at the same time because you know, Erdogan seems to have come out quite on top of this, right, in basically getting the U.S. government across administrations to cower away from essentially standing behind uh, the Syrian Kurds who have done untold sort of sacrifices uh, to, to eliminate and degrade ISIS in the last, you know, decade or more, right, and have really paid the highest cost, I would argue, in the region. Um, and what we see on the other hand uh, is basically, you know, the Turkish government still materially supporting actually has, you know, forces on the ground in, in, in Syria that actively supports remnants of Al Qaeda as well as other jihadist elements, you know, uh, for, 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 that's quite inexplicable to me. But what I would cite as the, the actual success of Erdogan is him hammering down on this notion of, PK, you know, PKK, YPG, they're all the same, he says. They're terrorists and they should be dealt with accordingly. And what we see is the United States government never really owning its relationship, its, its, its ties with uh, an entity, which are the Syrian Kurds, we'll call them the Syrian Democratic Forces or whatever you want to call them, right? Who have not once made one overt or covert threat to Turkey, have never carried out an act of violence against Turkey. They have no aspirations towards Turkish territory, right? Um, and Basically, he holds the U.S. government and the West hostage over this, right? Well, uh, uh, why does the U.S. not essentially own their partners and say, you know, back off? This is an issue. Get with the program. They're not with terrorists. And you could actually resolve this issue if you wanted, just like you resolve your situation and relationship with the KRG, with the Iraqi Kurds. What's holding you back? Uh, well, Sinan, I absolutely agree with you. And I'll be very brief because I don't want to uh, take the floor from Tucha or Galia. But... Um, first of all, we should throw the same logic back, and we, we tend not to deal with our partners the same way, saying, look, if you don't think that the Kurds have evolved with regard to their um, political ideology, can you say the same thing about the Ikhwan, about the Muslim Brotherhood? Um, has that not evolved? Are you not, therefore, a, a terrorist? Uh, or the same thing with Mili Garouche. But what drives me nuts is something different, which is too often in the United States, whether it's with regard to terror finance, with whether it's with regard to Turkey's um, soft underbelly of support for terrorism, we want to say, okay, at this point, we all recognize that Erdogan is bad. I mean, even his former defenders will say that. But they say we can't, we can't do too much damage to the relationship because we have to worry about what comes in after Erdogan. But here's the problem. More than 30 million Turkish school children have been educated under Erdoganism. He's completely reshaped the Turkish military. Um, and at the same time, even if we get someone who is democratic, someone who's liberal, even if I win the lottery tomorrow, Erdogan has shown the power of this populism. So even if we get a liberal interregnum of a year or two, 
I suspect we're looking at a situation where we're going to see future Erdogans. And I'm afraid, quite honestly, that one may be visiting Washington, D.C. as we speak. Right. I mean, there's so much to take away from there. I would say, you know, uh, Foreign Minister Fidan has been identified as the person who essentially allowed organizational space and diplomatic cover to establish Hamas inside of Turkey. Right. He's the main architect of that. I would also say for all the sort of um, grudgings that we have or the Turkish government has towards the United States, which I call a manufactured threat uh, for, for, for its support of, of, of the PYD, we, we never remind the Turkish government that it was the United States in concert with Israel, I might add, uh, with, with both intelligence services that handed Abdullah Öcalan to Turkish authorities back in the late 90s. And this should just be shouted from the rooftops. The amount of you know uh, satellite imagery and drone imagery that we gave to Turkey uh, as part of the DOD programs up until recently, right, that provided sort of essential cover over Turkey's airspace over its Iraqi border. Not all of this has been forgotten by the Turks, and they just want to hammer on down this sort of manufactured threat, as I call or, it. Or, Sinan, that the only reason we turn to the PYD uh, around the time of the siege of Kobana, they were our plan B. The reason they were our plan B was because our plan A, working with Turkey, didn't work because Turkey seemed to be um, with a nod and a wink, supporting the wrong side. Can I add some points? Absolutely, Tucha. Go ahead. I was going okay. to ask you, but go ahead first, and I have um, a question for you afterwards. I mean, I agree with uh, most of the points. Uh, since we are talking about the uncertainty of U.S. politics towards the northern Syria, maybe we need to highlight some questions. Uh, what I'm assuming is Turkish part is asking constantly, uh, United States, what is your plan in Syria? Because Turkey is saying officially, this is our red line, okay? We are we are not allowing you to create a Kurdish state here. At least we know the statement, okay? But from United States, we don't know clearly what is the plan. But let me remind you one thing. Uh, what is happening between PKK and YPJ? Right now, PKK is uh, having some problems in northern Iraq. Uh, clashing with uh, clashing with the Barzani government, right? And uh, I just want to um, highlight one more point. What I see is I'm uh, I see that the elimination of PKK, transitioning YPJ in a legal format, if not state, but still a legalized administration. But United States seems like giving itself a space and time. Uh, as you um, mentioned, Michael, very well, the uh, definition of terrorism is more than 100. Every year there are new definitions. And at the same time, labeling terrorist organizations are changing too. It's a dynamic uh, matter. Let's say 10 years ago you were labeling terrorist A, group A, okay, but this year maybe they are liberalization organization. So what I see is uh, every actor in the region should be careful. Five years later, 10 years later, we don't know what will be United States policy. I don't want to see another uh, growing of terrorist organization for United States. Okay. I'm, I'm, I hope I'm clear because there's, there's, it's a gray area right now. Not a terrorist organization. Okay. Not a state. But what are you trying to do? What is your goal in Syria? That's my point. Um, that's Sorry. a crucial point. I think that's a I appreciate point. that, Tuche, simply because I, I would agree with you that which expands across administrations. Certainly, since you know uh, the, the 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 death blow that was dealt on the ISIS forces in the late 2010s. Since then, I would agree with you that you know we've been very muddled in this country as to you know what our policy towards Syria and what the future of that looks like. I think the only thing that we have going on is to maintain our sort of lukewarm and somewhat embarrassed position towards supporting the Syrian Kurdish forces because we want them to man the ISIS prisons. We want them to continue pursuing any remnants of, 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 of ISIS fighters so that they, they don't resurge. Um, but let me ask you this. This was what I was going to ask you. I mean, you know, based on, you know, Michael's comments and that the, the, the discussion just we had with him before this, which would lead into sort of the Russia perspective too, because it seems to me that both things are linked in one sense. Do you think that, you know, Western reluctance to sort of highlight and, and show, um, you know, show up Turkey's sort of unhelpful behavior towards the Ukraine-Russia war, unhelpful behavior towards what's going on in, in, in Israel uh, to, against, you know, in its war with Hamas, 
is based on this notion of a pathological fear of losing Turkey, quote unquote. They just don't want to cross that threshold because they say we don't know what the, the, the scenario is going to look like five years from now. Uh, so you're talking about the worst case scenario. Everybody's yeah, um, thinking about this. <clears throat> okay, uh, there are some uh, points that you are right. Okay, uh, in, in NATO partnership, there's always a worst case scenario if one day we lose Turkey from uh, the alliance. Uh, I want to tell you something. Right now, uh, yes, uh, Russia is invading Ukraine, attacking Ukraine. And we are talking about if Ukraine is defeated, then what will happen? And there are reasonable concerns in Europe, Baltic countries. I totally understand them. Uh, however, my projection is after defeating Ukraine, Russia's next target will be Turkey. Turkey will be completely vulnerable against victorious Russia uh, because Russian companies already in United uh, in Turkey already operating Russian diaspora right now in Turkey and they are creating their own um, economy uh, so to speak and that that's the worst case scenario so I I think there there is risk for this maybe it's a low percentage. Uh, but given that the uh, corrupted Turkish politics, uh, I mean, it's not a uh, declining democracy anymore. It's not a democracy. Let's be honest. So under these circumstances, it's going to take Erdogan's just uh, one minute decision to be, uh, you know, to increase its partnership with Russia. Uh, here is another another scenario for you. If Russia completes the construction of nuclear aqua power plant in Mersin, and then completes the construction of natural gas storage in the Thracia area, okay, just next to Bulgaria and Greece, uh, I am uh, assuming that Russia will ask from Turkey to provide Russia either a military base or permissions for their uh, you know, uh, navigation of their military bases to protect their investments, okay? Uh, I mean, Turkey will be a NATO uh, member uh, maybe in that uh, scenario. Let me remind you, is there any country uh, uh, hosted uh, United States and Russian military uh, bases at the same time in history? Yes, there is. Kyrgyzstan, uh, Manas Airbus, but we know how it ended at the end. So that might be a case. Yes. If I could just two finger that, Sanan, and two just absolutely right. It reminds me just how we have spent so much diplomatic capital over the last five or six years across both the Trump and Biden administrations getting Cyprus to stop Russian port calls and Russian use of separate soil only to turn around and have the Russians flip Turkey to some extent on us in this regard. Yeah, fair enough. It's, I mean, it's uh, interesting policy projections or you know future predictions uh, from both of you. It's, uh, it's hard. But um, this is a this is an open question to all. But I'll start with Galia, um, if I may. Um, you know, we may vary on the definitions of terrorism. I understand and I take that point well. It's been a scholarly matter of debate forever. And we're all, you know, uh, we all went to graduate school and we wrestled with some of these ideas. And 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 and, and the terrorism aspect actually is, is, a, is a deep rabbit hole, which I think we should be considered about. Um, but, but on the issue of Hamas and Palestine Islamic Jihad, Hezbollah, right, where I see Turkey fundamentally failing to condemn, even on basic grounds. I mean, we saw President Erdogan days after the October 7 attacks call Hamas a group of mujahideen, right, um, and, and freedom fighters. And we see him shaking hands and hosting people like, you know, before his death, Saleh al aruri We've seen sort of Hamas's most senior leadership come in and go out of Turkey who have passports issued to them by the Turkish government, right? We, you know, um, for an entity that literally in October 7 ripped apart women on camera, uh, which is, you know, horrific to even countenance, let alone watch, how are we in a situation where Turkey cannot simply condemn this? Is this just what, in your opinion, Gali, a reflection of Erdogan's political convictions that he's through and through a sort of Islamist that, that he cannot retract from. This is 
how he is programmed historically, or is this just you know a, a tactical strategy? So first of all, uh, I agree with you that um, I mean this definition of terror is not just an intellectual thing we do, but I think Turkey well understands that what Hamas did is terrorism. I think there's no country that can sympathize with Israel more than Turkey. And I think deep down they know that. I think they know that they're living in a glass house themselves. And I'm a little bit even more sympathetic to their concern from the Syrian Kurds because we remember how uh, Syria yet was used by the PKK in the 1990s uh, against Turkey. So I'm a little bit more sympathetic here. Also, I agree with you that uh, since the beginning of the Syrian civil war, the Syrian Kurds have not presented a concrete uh, threat to Turkey. It's only historically been a threat. Um, so they do have uh, this uh, this terror and they, the, the, their terror threats come from different way places, uh, also from ISIS. Uh, I can compare the terrible Reina nightclub uh, uh, terror attack of ISIS to this uh, Nova music festival attack by Hamas. Both were basically targeting young people who were dancing and having a good time and were completely helpless in face of the terrorists. So I think it's a, it's a mistake on behalf of Turkey. I think uh, Turkey's friends should remind Turkey that it's a mistake. And why is Turkey doing it? Then yes, there is the ideology, the Muslim Brotherhood uh, joint ideology that is is, is directing uh, Erdogan. I think Erdogan is uh, uh, honestly sympathetic to the Palestinian cause and thinks that Hamas is promoting it, but in that you can differentiate between Hamas political branch and, and, and Hamas military branch, but I think this is complete, it was nonsense before October 7th and it's uh, definitely nonsense now. And there's also the money issue. Yes, all this illicit uh, la money laundering is is uh, profitable uh, to someone. But uh, and again, I think here uh, Turkey's friends should uh, jump in and also the US and make it clear that this is not profitable anymore because it will have ramifications and it's much easier or not much easier, but it's much better to do uh, to sanction illicit uh, funding than to do war. And I think that's where the international community should come in. The US, the, the EU, they're in the right direction, but they should be more insistent on it. And uh, if, if I may really quickly, Sanan, um, the thing that I think needs to be brought out, and I agree with Galia, is this isn't new. I remember, I think it was in February of 2006, I was actually in Ankara um, in, I believe, CNN Turk, um, the TV studio, when word came that Hamas's leader, I guess at the time, Khalid Mashal, had undertaken a surprise visit to Turkey. The reason why it was a surprise visit was just two weeks before Recep Tayyip Erdogan had told German Chancellor Angela Merkel that he, that he would not invite Hamas out, uh, in solidarity with the European and the Western position that Hamas shouldn't be legitimized after the 2006 elections until it agreed to the fundamentals of the Oslo Accords, that is recognition of the state of Israel and forswaring terrorism. Erdogan turned around and simply exposed himself as a liar. And again, he tried to have it both ways by then telling the West, well, I didn't invite them. It was the AKP, it was the political party. Nevertheless, they had red carpet treatment and so forth. This game has been going on for, for close to 20 years. What amazes me is how long Western diplomacy can be like Charlie Brown, Lucy in the football, um, making the same mistake 17, 18, 19 times in a row. Tucci, I'm going to jump in if you, if you have a... Uh, <clears throat> Just last uh, comment, I mean, uh, knowing Erdogan for uh, more than two decades, uh, I think he would uh, prefer to die instead of condemning a ter uh, Islamist terrorist organization, okay? Yeah, I mean, one of the things I've thought about, um, you know, uh, it reminded me all your comments, which is, um, I remember this sort of heyday of, you know, Turkey as the model country that was sort of visited upon the outgoing Bush administration and the incoming Obama administration as a sort of model country. We, I remember when it was thick as thieves with the Gulen movement in Washington to essentially really sort of have a congressional caucus that supported Turkey, that really saw, you know, projected as a, as a, as a shining jewel in, 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 the, in the Muslim world, especially in the region. Only a few years after, during, you know, the height, at the height of the Arab uprisings failure, um, people started asking Washington, what, you know, what changed? Why is Erdogan changed? Why is he going full in support of you know the muslim brotherhood 
Why is he not essentially you know, backing democratic movements? How do we explain things like his entrenchment with the Russian Federation? You know, and my answer to this has always been quite simple. I mean, nothing changed, right? Erdogan has been schooled in political Islam for all of his political career, his entire upra upbringing and upraising as an individual, but as, as, also, as, as well as a political actor. You're not going to change uh, a 70 year old's you know, um, uh, worldview. And he was 48 when he came to power. You know, I'm 46, and I don't think my political views are going to change at this point. Um, and, and so, you know, Erdogan has been kind of coy, I would say, over a number of years. But I agree with Michael's sentiment too that, you know, this, this game has been going on for a long, long time. Um, and, you know, it's per Tuche's comments, I don't think he's going to condemn anybody. Um, but I would also caution Turkey, as, as you have too, Chair, which is to suggest, and, and Galia, that some of this could really come to bite Turkey in, in the behind if, if, if you, know, you know, it's continuing what it's continuing support for jihadist entities in Syria. What happens when those are terminated? What about the remnants of ISIS fighters that are sort of, uh, you know, domiciled inside of Turkey um, who occasionally launch terror attacks? Um, none of these questions have um, an answer. So we've got a few minutes left here, about just under five minutes. And um, I want to go around and just ask you a hypothetical question and get your feedback on this. Um, I'll let Michael go first. Um, so, you know, as we said, uh, Foreign Minister Fidan is, is, is visiting Washington this week. He's, he talked to the foreign Turkish Foreign Minister, sorry, uh, Secretary Blinken yesterday, I believe. You know, if you were in a position of advising the Secretary of State, um, what would you want him to convey right now in, in relation to the events that, you know, the topics that we've talked about? What would you be your asks to convey to the Secretary of State that he can confer to his Turkish counterpart? Well, number one, it's just a matter of what we shouldn't do. We shouldn't allow Erdogan ever to step foot in the White House again. We shouldn't give him a platform to, down, to praise Hamas from the center of Washington, D.C., I would also suggest that we should play the same game that Erdogan plays. Uh, whereas we can be diplomatically cordial to Hakan Fidan, but if Congress, for example, wants to go a little bit further and apply global Magnitsky Act sanctions, or at least cast doubt on the support which Hakan, get, uh, Hakan Fidan gets in Washington, that would be useful. Remember, for all the anti-Americanism that exists in AKP circles, there's still a belief that Washington's endorsement matters. This is why Recep Tayyip Erdogan relied on Paul Wolfowitz and Richard Pearl to show him around Washington uh, back shortly before he became prime minister. We need to do everything possible to suggest that number one, our support isn't free if it's coming at all, that Turkey needs to act first. Uh, Galia. So, I mean, for I think, and it's probably because I'm Israeli, but not only that the October 7th is a watershed uh, event, I think uh, Turkey is getting nothing of its support of Hamas. It's not getting any role in mediation. It's getting only shame. And, and, and what I think, uh, and if it can condemn it publicly, as you both uh, suggested, then it can, but it can make uh, the life of Hamas operative on, on Turkish soil much harder. It can expel them. It can it stop giving them passports. Why are you giving them passports? There's a lot Turkey can do, and that will be very beneficial also to the Palestinians and the Palestinian cause. Last but not least, to chair. Uh, it's a uh, paradox for United States foreign policy right now, right? Uh, Turkey's position, uh, how you need to keep uh, Turkey in a NATO alliance, but at the same time, you need to uh, maybe sanction in some areas. So uh, from foreign policy perspective, I would uh, not give Turkey to continue its illegal financial activities because it's a huge crime, very important crime. Uh, but at the same time, uh, unfortunately, ge from geopolitical perspective, I would try to keep Na uh, Turkey in the NATO as much as I can. Yeah. Yeah. Um, thank you for all of this. I would just end on my sort of small two cents on this uh, to make time, which is to suggest that I agree with Michael that it would be a monumental mistake, as some have alluded to, that you know, if, if President Biden was to welcome uh, uh, Erdogan at the White House as part of an agreement uh, of the Swedish accession deal, right? Simply because if that occurs, I would not hold it against Erdogan to admonish the U.S. president outside of, uh, outside the White House on the on, in the Rose Garden or on the South Lawn and praise Hamas 
in a similar way that he did to the German chancellor on German soil, which I would, which is just simply unforgivable. We should avoid that mistake. Look, thank you for everything, guys. Um, we are out of time, and uh, we thank you for your time, and uh, we thank you to all of our audiences and to FTD's communications team for making this talk posi uh, uh, possible. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.